You're listening to podcasts from the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, www.netcaucus.org. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. So welcome to this panel, Disrupting ISIS Online, the Challenges of Combating Online Radicalization. This panel is put on by the Advisory Committee to the Congressional Internet Caucus, and we're hosted by the Congressional Internet Caucus. Uh, and we'd like to thank the co-chairs, uh, Congressman Bob Goodlatte and Congresswoman Anna Eshoo, and um, Senator John Thune and Patrick Leahy for hosting us here today. Uh, we have the, the, the caucus hosts events every few weeks on, on salient topics to the Internet and policy, and we invite you to come out for, for events coming out throughout the summer. So uh, today we have um, several excellent panelists with us today. Um, we have Emma Lanso from the Center for Democracy and Technology, who works on the Free Expression Project. We have Rashad Hussein from the Department of Justice, working on countering vi violent extremism um, over there. And we also have Seamus Hughes, who's the Deputy Director for the Program on Extremism at jo George Washington University's Center for Cyber and Homeland Security. And my name is Miranda Bogan, and I'm a fellow at the uh, Internet Law and Policy Foundry um, and was a fellow at the Congressional Internet Caucus in the past. So let's get started. Um, I'll just give a brief overview of, of the issue going on, and then we'll jump right into it and, and get into like, what's, what's the real issue here with uh, extremists online, what role do the platforms like Twitter, Facebook, Google play in this, and, and how, what is the right way to be approaching um, the issue of, of dealing with extremist content online and, and recruitment for uh, terrorist groups abroad. So as, as you may have seen going on, we have the social media platforms like, like Twitter and Facebook have generally, especially in their early years, been quite in favor of leaving their platforms as places for free expression. And they've been adamantly, like adamant supporters of that, but um, gradually, especially over the past few years, we've seen that being taken advantage of by um, groups like uh, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, like um, Al-Qaeda, and then we have the Islamic State beginning to use the platforms even more actively than that, really bringing it to a, a totally different level. And now the platforms are facing pressure on multiple sides from government, the government here, from governments abroad, from their users to do something more to take the content out of people's social feeds. You know, it's not something you want to see every day, but also, um, you know, it's not something that we want. This content is not, not something that we want spreading around um, because it is generally effective in recruiting uh, people to go abroad and, and join these causes. So. Why don't we turn to Seamus, who's really been working on this issue and tracking this phenomenon over time. Can you tell us, like, when did this start? Like, how are the platforms being used? What are the groups doing? Yeah, I think it started when the Internet started, right? <laughs> um, so in the early ages, when we looked at, at terrorist groups online, it was on the password-protected forums, the dozen or so that we were worried about. And then as the Internet shifted over to more open platforms like Twitter and Facebook, you know, so did recruitment. So if you look at the number of individuals who have been arrested for ISIS-related charges in the U.S., it's 85 individuals since March 2014. The average age is 26. Um, so ISIS recruiters and spotters are going online to where their demographic is. Um, so that tends to be Twitter. Uh, we've seen a shift actually moving back over to Telegram and other platforms, but they clearly use the online environment in a way that uh, is conducive for them to recruit. Uh, think of it in, like, three ways. So... They use it as grooming. So over the summer, the program on extremism at George Washington, we did a six-month study of ISIS recruits online, uh, mostly focusing on Americans but also English language speakers. So we look at about 1,000 accounts on a daily basis. Uh, of those, you, you, you see them essentially grooming online. So we watched a young woman from the Midwest who had questions about her faith, uh, and an ISIS recruiter realized she was naive and was answering the questions in a very innocuous way. And then a few weeks later, she would slowly, he would slowly introduce the ISIS narrative into the conversation. So they're, re they're using it as spotters to try to recruit people. The other way to, they use it is essentially logistical support. Uh, an individual like Muhammad Khan, a 19-year-old kid from Chicago, uh, when he gets picked up at O'Hare Airport, him and his underage um, siblings, a 17-year-old, 16-year-old, planning to go to join uh, ISIS, when they arrested him, they went through his stuff and realized he had four numbers, and he received those numbers of people to call when he got to Turkey uh, through the contacts he made on Twitter. So it's logistical support. It lowers the bar for an individual to be able to meet a radicalized recruiter online. 
And then the last way they do it is essentially what the FBI director says, the devil on the shoulder. So egging people on to do this. Now, putting all of that in context, you also have to realize that the numbers pale in comparison to any other form of, of conversation online. You know, you're talking about 44,000 Twitter accounts for ISIS supporters. The English language scene is anywhere between, you know, 1,000 and 3,000 people uh, accounts online. Some of them are bots and some of them are not. Uh, but they're clearly using the online environment. And the last thing I'd like to say is it's not like if Twitter went away tomorrow, we wouldn't have uh, recruits that were joining, right? So uh, the fact that there's a physical space, that there's a so-called caliphate, that is a driver for people to go in. Um, Twitter, Telegram, places like that, essentially just help facilitate that, that recruitment. But they're not the reason why people decide to become radicalized and join um, groups like this. It allows in the U.S. for, when you see at least the people that have been arrested, communities don't radicalize in America. Individuals do. Um, we don't have these you know, pockets of radicalization like you would have in some European countries. Um, here, if you're trying to find a like-minded individual, you're usually trying to find that online. Maybe I'll leave it there. Um, Rashad, maybe you can tell us about how the Department of Justice and the government is approaching this phenomenon and, and how you're working to combat. Well, it's, it's a threat that we take very seriously. Uh, our first priority, of course, at the Justice Department is to protect the American people from attacks. And what we're seeing ISIL do online is use some very sophisticated techniques. And Seamus talked about uh, some of the, of the approaches that they've used They've also done something different than previous groups in that they've adopted a crowdsourcing model through which they encourage anyone, anywhere to go out and commit attacks against innocent people. So the challenge, part of the challenge we face as government is we have to be successful 100% of the time. ISIL is overwhelmingly rejected. They're recruiting millions of people around the world. One, they, they reach out to an audience of 1.6 billion Muslims and others. And even if they are successful um, in a minuscule number of those cases, then you still have a problem of 20,000 to 30,000 foreign fighters. You still have the problem of ISIS getting followers uh, all around the world. And they're very adept at using different techniques, targeting different audiences in multiple languages. What they've tried to do is reach out to disaffected youth and offer a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging. Uh, they use a combination of... Uh, uh, strength and warmth that they try to, to lure uh, recruits with, a sense of camaraderie. And as twisted as it sounds, they claim to be building something. So we've all seen uh, the atrocities that they've broadcast around the world, uh, but they've also uh, put out positive messaging. Uh, as mentioned, the themes of camaraderie and strength and warmth, and they claim to be building something and they're calling people to build something, which is, uh, in their conception, the khilaf or the, or the caliphate. And so one of the realizations that we have uh, as government is that there are m multiple audiences, and we have to be smart about using the right messengers to reach the right audiences. So government isn't always going to be the right messenger to reach the various audiences we're trying to reach. Roughly speaking, uh, taking a look at the audiences, you have a class of fence-sitters that are potentially thinking about joining um, ISIL in the short term. Then you have uh, the immediate influencers around them, the families, friends, peers. Then you have a set of cultural influencers that can uh, influence um, publics generally. And then you have kind of a, a mass audience or general publics. And so government may be more effective in the prevention space and reaching out to people that haven't already bought into aspects of the propaganda or the, or the ideology, but you really need uh, specific audiences to reach, for example, the, the specific class of fence-sitters. Who are fence-sitters going to listen to? It's a, it's, a, it's a question that we think about. Perhaps they'll only listen to other extremists, uh, maybe ex and maybe those are extremists that are not violent extremists, but people that are extreme in their views that can persuade them to come back. That's not a role for the government to play. Um, who are, is the best audience to reach out to cultural influencers? So what we've tried to do uh, in government is, where possible, uh, message ourselves to the audiences which we think we can reach. And some of the common themes that we've, uh, that we've used are to highlight uh, ISIL's atrocities against uh, particularly Muslim communities who, who they're also killing in big numbers, amplifying the stories of uh, people that have defected from ISIL's former radicals, highlighting ISIL's battlefield losses. Seamus noticed, noted that 
um, they actually have territory which they can point to and say, come in and help us uh, establish the Khilafah. So we point to the losses that they're taking, particularly in Iraq uh, and Syria. And uh, we've also tried to expose the living conditions, and defectors have done some of that uh, under ISIL territories. And perhaps most importantly, we think it's important to work not just the government, but with partners to disseminate positive messages uh, that make clear what the rest of us stand for, what the rest of Muslim communities stand for, and to highlight positive alternatives. So if someone says, I really have a problem with what's happening in, in Syria under, under the Bashar regime, and I want to do something about it, we've got to find other paths for people to take that are constructive rather than destructive. So it sounds like we have... The, the dual use of the internet both as a platform for recruitment but also as a platform for engagement on the other side. And we also see that the, the platforms are torn between taking down violent content and, and threatening content and, and on one hand leaving it up for intelligence purposes and on the other hand really trying to minimize what they're taking down um, because so they, that they don't have to be the ones judging what is appropriate content and what is not. So maybe, Emma, can you tell us about the, the response we've seen from the companies and some of the concerns they might be considering when they're um, asked to comment on, on, on how to approach this issue? Sure, yeah. Um, so obviously over the past year and a half... Can you hear me now? Ah, great. Um, clearly, over the past year and a half, we've seen a huge amount of scrutiny on um, major internet companies, you know, the big social media platforms, about how are they responding to the existence of so-called extremist content online. Um, and it might help to describe just a little bit sort of the, the legal framework around um, around speech online. You know, what what is it that enables the kind of the exchange of information um, and expression of opinions uh, that we all enjoy? Um, in the U.S., we've got both the strong protections of the First Amendment for speech um, where we have, uh, you know, very high standards for what is uh, speech that the government can actually say is unlawful. Um, kind of relevant issues uh, in that context are, um, you know, is a comment a direct incitement to imminent lawless action or imminent violence? Um, is it a, a true threat? of uh, violence or, um, you know, or intended violence against uh, another individual. Uh, but we don't generally have broad prohibitions against hate speech, um, and there's no, there's certainly no kind of definition of extremist content as, uh, you know, a set of unlawful speech. So already we're sort of in an environment where what exactly are we talking about, what sort of speech and content um, are we talking about is unclear. Um, what we've seen a lot of the companies do is um, in trying to apply their, their terms of service, which uh, are kind of variable across platforms, um, as ways to, uh, to remove content that gets reported to them. Um, so Internet companies, you know, hosts of our speech online are generally protected from any legal liability for speech that they are not themselves the author of. Uh, this is Section 230 of the Communications Act um, that ensures that if I, for example, tweet something defamatory about Seamus, Seamus can sue me, of course, because I'm the one who said the comment, but he can't go and sue Twitter um, about it. And th this law has been incredibly important to the, um, you know, amazing innovation we've seen uh, with the Internet and with online platforms, um, and also to just supporting speech online. Uh, all of us depend on a number of different intermediaries being willing to, to host and transmit our speech. Um, if, you know, if you're a ISP or your social media provider could face legal liability for your speech, they'd be very <laughs> unlikely to be willing to let you to, um, to speak. So, but also in, in that law, uh, companies are protected from liability for their decisions to remove speech. Um, this is where we see uh, companies developing terms of service where they set out the standards for what kind of speech they'll accept on their platforms um, and what they'll say is kind of a violation of, of their rules or standards. Um, and so a lot of the platforms have rules about hate speech, even though this is very often speech that's totally protected under the law in the U.S. Um, they may still say that they don't want to host speech that is uh, denigrating of a particular group or class. Um, most of them have uh, standards against um, direct threats or threats of violence. Uh, I believe Facebook has a standard um, 
against dangerous organizations in particular, um, by which they tend to mean terrorist organizations or organized crime. So we've seen kind of a range of different kinds of terms grow up on the different platforms um, over the years, and companies then, in response to kind of user flags about speech that appears to violate their terms, will take a look at at content and see, you know, does this seem to go too far? Does this step over the line of what they've already described um, to be acceptable or not acceptable on their platforms? So... I'm interested to hear from the rest of the panel about this balance of sort of the opportunity of the internet as a platform to spread various uh, different types of speech, positive speech, um, to, to keep track of what's going on, and sort of the desire to to um, control this the dangerous speech, the hate speech. Um, what have you seen in, in the research arena? How do you see that playing out? Sure. Um, so I'm kind of dual-hatted on this one. We have a, a fellow at the Programming Extremism, uh, J.M. Berger, who looked at English language accounts over a, a month period to figure out if takedown was effective or not. Um, and here's a takeaway with a caveat. Um, they were take, they, the takedown of accounts were effective in terms of uh, reducing the number of followers that the person had when they came back, on, particularly on, on Twitter. Um, there's the first part. Here's the second part that kind of um, we should also keep in mind. There's a built-in system for resiliency into the system. So uh, an individual like Terrence McNeil, uh, who was arrested for terrorism-related charges last fall, when we started watching him, he was Lone Wolf 7. Um, by the time he was arrested, he was Lone Wolf 21. He'd been kicked off 14 different times. Every time he came back as Lone Wolf 8, 9, 10, uh, um, the ISIS, there's an ISIS echo chamber that essentially has shout-out accounts. So they build in resiliency, and they say, here's Lone Wolf 8. He used to be Lone Wolf 7. Everyone follow him. Um, so there's there's a built-in system that says um, we know we're going to get kicked off for violating terms of service, um, but we're going to be able to help other people to make sure they get back on. So we have to do this balancing act. From a researcher's perspective, I mean, you clearly want more data as much as you possibly can. It's clearly a balancing act from a public policy perspective uh, on whether takedown is, is the necessary way. I tend to think that um, I tend to be more on the uh, positive and counter and alternative messaging than I am on takedown, although there is some instances where I think takedown is warranted. Yeah, I mean, we've been encouraged by uh, companies enforcing their terms of service, and you know, there's echo chambers out there uh, in the violent extremism world where they're posting you know, uh, violent tweets and beheading videos, and there's not a lot of intelligence value uh, necessarily in that echo chamber. Now, where there may be um, some limited cases in which uh, it can be helpful, and there is some intelligence value, and that can always be communicated um, to uh, to companies. Um, but for the most part, uh, you know, I, I agree with uh, Seamus's view on it. Now, it's important again to remember that overwhelmingly, ISIL is rejected around the world, and there's a reason for that. Um, it's because of largely because of their own actions, and a lot of the atrocities that they're committing. Uh, the, the stories that have been told by people that have been impacted uh, by ISIL and other groups, the stories of defectors, all of those are getting out um, through social media as well. And so it's, I know we have, you know, perhaps a thousandth of a percent of people who are targeted by ISIL have gone uh, and joined, and that's unacceptably high for, uh, for all of us because we're trying to prevent any single attack from uh, ever happening. But it's important to remember that these platforms also provide an opportunity to put out not just counter-messaging, but positive messaging that allow the rest of us, including Muslim communities, to, to communicate what we stand for. Yeah. And that's really, I mean, the risk of the overbroad content policy, or particularly like increasing pressure on companies to to strengthen their policies, make the, make them so that more content can come down, is that it is this, you know, potentially vastly overbroad response to what ends up being, you know, as, as Seamus' research seems to indicate, um, you know, it's a lot of one-on-one -on -one communications that end up driving the actual, you know, an individual to commit an act of violence. And if you're trying to capture one-on-one, -on -one, highly tailored, direct conversations with a policy that's about taking down all of the speech that's sort of in the general area of discussing ISIS and and terrorism and U.S. foreign policy, you're throwing out a whole lot of baby with very little bathwater. Uh. So 
that's a, a good segue because we, we have had some pressure from the U.S. government to add additional liabilities for the platforms or at least to um, uh, compel them to turn over certain information if they come across it or, to, or for government agencies to use certain information in their response. Um, and we've also had more collaborative approaches with the summits between the administration and Silicon Valley, both here and in California. Um, what is your sense of the right way to approach this if, if the overbroad approach is uh, just that? Um, yeah, well, so there, there have been um, some proposals in Congress that would uh, try to require Internet companies to report apparent terrorist activity to the government if they identify it. Um, and this, this kind of proposal is, is pretty concerning. Um, there's uh, not, in the particular bills that um, have been proposed, there's no real definition of what terrorist activity might be. Um, and what that sort of model would set up is basically a huge incentive for all of our communications providers to err on the side of caution in reporting their users to the government as a suspected terrorist or as suspected to be involved with terrorist activity. Um, I think the kind of the result of that would be a huge amount of over-reporting, which is both incredibly concerning for individual civil liberties, you know, our right to, to privacy in our own communications, um, and also not really generating useful information um, for, for law enforcement. Uh, so I think it's very much more um, what Rashad had been saying about the, the need to support the, the environment where the defectors or the journalists or the advocates who are out there countering the message um, that ISIS presents and providing their own, uh, you know, kind of positive viewpoints and positive ideas, we need to ensure that there are strong protections for free speech in place so that that can happen. Um, we unfortunately see there's there's reports by the Committee to Protect Journalists about the way that uh, anti-terrorism laws in Egypt and Turkey, you know, countries that are allies in the fight against ISIS, um, are also using those anti-terrorism laws to put journalists in jail. Um, and that kind of overbroad approach that ends up constraining the speech of exactly those people that we need to get different viewpoints and different messages out there is a real risk. Um. There's also kind of an interesting dynamic here because you can think about the government's amazing ability for convening, and there's a convening power, right? So if I pick the phone and call 10 social media providers and get them in a room, that's a very hard pitch. If Rashad does it, it's a different pitch, right? You, you, there's, there's an ability to do that. You know, I think back to my um, days in government. I was in Sacramento, and I was talking to uh, an imam who wanted to do counter-ISIS videos online. And I said, well, sir, what do you, what do you want to do? He said, well, I'm going to grab my phone and record myself talking about how ISIS is wrong for the following reasons. So that's that's great, sir, but no one's going to watch that. It's going to be 10 minutes of you holding your phone. Um, but here you have a guy who wants to do the messaging but has no idea how to use a platform, right? He has no idea where, how to tag the videos so they pop up when the next uh, Alaki video pops up, things like that. But the government has the ability to, to play the convener, uh, to play the matchmaker in this situation that says, listen, we're not going to decide what the content is. We, have, we don't actually want to be anywhere near this thing. But here's somebody we know here that you may want to talk to about these type of things. Yeah, and that's how we've tried to use our convening role by bringing together, um, you know, the types of community leaders you mentioned, civil society, um, artists, uh, people that are adept uh, at, at using social media and the platform, you know, advertising sector, Silicon Valley companies. And, you know, after that, our job is to stay in communication to some extent, but realizing that government is not the best messenger um, in this space, is to, our, our job is to also step back and allow the creative people that know how to put out the best positive messaging and, and counter-messaging uh, to do their thing. And there is evidence to indicate that uh, we're making steady progress in this area. Um, you know, not only have the social media companies uh, we've had cooperative relationships and discussions with, um, not only have we seen announcements such as Twitter, Twitter's announcement that they've taken down 125,000 uh, ISIL-affiliated accounts, um, but we've also seen polling data indicating that larger and larger percentages of young Arab populations are totally ruling out any possibility of joining ISIL. There was a survey that came out recently that said 80% of 18 to 24 uh, year olds in the Arab world um, in 16 countries that were uh, were surveyed 
uh, said that they would never even con- consider joining it. And uh, if you would, ask, if you were to do a poll of um, the disapproval rating of ISIL in, in many of these countries, it's even higher. So uh, we a lot of attention is paid uh, towards that the small percentage, and deservedly so, uh, that has bought into that ideology. But it's important to keep in mind that there's a lot of good work that's being done, um, largely outside of government, uh, to make sure that those that might be susceptible uh, to, to ISIL don't fall prey to their message. I think that's a very important point, too, because when you look at this, we're, we're talking about a manageable number. Uh, so the FBI director talks about some 900 to 1,000 active investigations in all 50 states, um, which, you know, from an FBI perspective looks very large, but from an actual messaging perspective, you can actually tailor your messaging to those 900 to 1,000 people. It's, that's a manageable number. You can do one-on-one interventions online. You're never going to be able to, you know, de- de-radicalize or disengage someone online, but you might be able to introduce a seed of doubt about, you know, the killing of civilians and things like that. And then you can have a real-life or offline conversation about how that person um, should come back in the fold. Yeah, and, re- and reaching that right uh, target audience uh, – is the challenge now? If it is, if, if the numbers uh, which uh, you you stated and we've talked about on this panel are approximately correct in terms of the number of people in the United States, for example, that might be susceptible uh, to ISIL's ideology, you don't want to have a messaging campaign when you're trying to target that group that sends the message that somehow all Muslim youth are vulnerable, or just because Muslim youth, some Muslim youth might face discrimination, that means that they might be susceptible to violent extremism. That's not the case. Um, Muslim youth in the United States overwhelmingly um, are excelling uh, in a number of fields. There's data that indicates that uh, per capita they're at the, at, at the same level or higher uh, education uh, uh, level, uh, per capita higher um, income levels uh, than, uh, their, you know, than, than people, of, people of other faiths. And so you don't want to have kind of a one-size-fits-all mass messaging approach to reach um, the audience uh, that we've talked about. And if you look at Seamus's report in terms of the ISIL-related uh, arrests, I believe there's a statistic in there that says that 40% of those that are, were arrested are recent converts to Islam. So sometimes there's a narrative out there that um, because there's youth that have grown up alienated, um, they're somehow Muslim youth are, 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 are generally susceptible or vulnerable to ISIL's recruitment. And you know the 40% of those that are recent converts, they didn't even grow up um, uh, as you know, in Muslim communities or as, as, uh, as young Muslims. And so we have to be careful at how we uh, message on this because you know, Muslim Americans sitting at their dinner table every night are talking about the same issues as all other Americans. ISIS is not number, the number one, con- because, just because they're Muslims, not the number one um, uh, conversa- conversation point at the dinner table. And in fact, uh, they're overwhelmingly uh, rejecting the message that, that ISIL is putting out there. And that's borne out by uh, all the data that we see. So messaging itself is, is one issue, like what do we say? How, and But it sounds like targeting is equally as important. So is there a role for Internet platforms to help in advising how to go about that targeting or to prioritize certain content algorithmically? Where like Are we seeing anything in that direction, or is that, from a speech perspective, equally as problematic as taking down content? Well, so some of the things that we've seen from um, a couple of the big social media platforms have been much less about actually kind of affecting the the main kind of content, whether it's, you know, a, the Facebook news feed or Twitter feed or search results. Um, they've been pretty clear about not wanting to change the and start manipulating those displays of information, kind of their core products, um, because of pressure from governments. And I think that's the right call, right? That I mean, that's that's the kind of overbearing government effect on, you know, the ac- our access to information and kind of what views and perspectives are out there that I think would really undermine a lot of the, the very good kind of counter narrative that, um, that we see coming out. Um, what we've seen some companies do is uh, kind of programs that they've had with nonprofits ar- around like a number of different kinds of topics, but really focusing in on um, on the the question of radicalization and extremism right now. Where in the kind of the advertising space that might appear alongside search engines or appear on your Facebook page, um, kind of 
sponsoring different uh, nonprofits to, you know, so that they can have the um, they can have their message show up kind of as an ad alongside related content. Uh, you know, I think there's still some questions there about, you know, is this companies getting too far into trying to promote certain ideas over others. We have this funny relationship with social media platforms where in a lot of ways we really like it when content that we care about is displayed to us and we don't want to see like 19 million baby photos if that's not what we're into. Um, But also when it seems like companies are taking a non-neutral or very ideologically motivated um, Position that can also make people feel really uncomfortable. And so I think a key part around all of this is transparency. Um, people are, I think, particularly uncomfortable when it's not clear where the motivation is coming from or where kind of the, how viewpoints are trying to be shaped. So the more that we can hear from the companies, what are they doing? Um, the more we can see kind of open public discussions about what government might be considering, what companies are considering, um, uh, you know, as, as opposed to kind of closed door meetings where we only sort of get leaks of agendas and, and bits and pieces of um, anonymous reports uh, in, in the news, the more transparent we can be about, you know, how are things being worked out and what influences are there, um, I think the more comfortable a lot of people will be. There was a lot of talk um not so recently, but before when, when the platforms seemed to be doing a little bit less to combat that, that maybe they were actually helping, but didn't really want to talk about it for two reasons. One being that you don't want to kind of show your cards to the people who are trying to game the system and put that content up. And two, that um, cooperating with the government, especially post the Snowden revelations, was n- not necessarily um, desirable for, for their users. And my sense is that we've seen a shift and users are now actually wanting to see more of that. Is that something you've seen? Um, and do you think that that trend of sort of trying to keep the distance will will start to evolve away from that and to see more public cooperation, or, or do you see that continuing? I mean, I, I, I'd come back to the point about transparency. Um, I think one takeaway we can have from the Snowden revelations is that when people finally, re- you don't want to surprise people with the scope of what's going on, um, that that creates a really strong backlash. Um, and, you know, it's it's our right as citizens to know how is our government you know, affecting the our environment for speech. How is our government, um, you know, influencing what access to information in the um, kind of in public do we have? And so, I think having these conversations um, more more publicly is really important. Which is not to say that you know necessarily we want really close coordination between governments and companies on this. I mean, very much for the point. Um, I was really glad to hear you talk about that sort of the recognition of when government needs to step back because the the worst thing would be to undermine the efforts of the people providing alternative viewpoints because those people are sort of, you know, cast as being too close to the U.S. government and so discounted for that reason. And I understand the sensitivities that you mentioned, Miranda. Um, but it's also, at the same time, it's true, and the social media companies um, uh, are very clear about the fact that they don't want to have their platforms being used by terrorists to spread their message. Uh, and so there is a lot of basis for cooperation, um, and we're seeing um, progress in that area. And I think that the trend is headed in the right direction, as you mentioned. So what, given that, given these sensitivities and given the sort of overbroad approaches that, that we think might not be the right way, what would be helpful from companies, from civil society, from the American people to um, helping combat this content in, in the right way, in a smart way? I think there's some low-hanging fruit on this. So if you look, when we did our report on ISIS in America, um, we talked to a number of um, Muslim American community members, uh, leaders, religious leaders on these type of things, and they said, listen, I want to do counter-messaging online. Like, I want to get on there. I want to engage. I want to talk to a kid that I'm worried about, and I want to bring him back into the fold. Um, but I'm worried that if I do, I'm going to get secondary at airports and things like that for engaging with a known radical, known respected terrorist. Um, I think there is some some level that you know, the Department of Justice or other organizations could provide um, at least some policy or legal guidance for what's acceptable and what's not online so that people aren't pinging against material support charges, which are very kind of very broad um, charge. Um, you know, I, I understand when I engage with, with these individuals um, that 
I'm probably going to hit up against stuff. But but I understand the risk and I know the transparency in it. Um, but to ask you know somebody from uh, Middle America who wants to do counter messaging to to understand those nuances without kind of a right and left latitude, I think that would be something that at least the government could provide um, relatively easily. Um, and I think one uh, one contribution that companies can make um, in all of this, you know, in addition to all of the work that they're already doing, is um, even more improvement in appeals processes for when people have their content come down or their accounts deactivated. Um, because, you know, we know as they're focusing on trying to enforce their terms consistently, um, you know, mistakes happen. Uh, turn the kind of the scale of content that gets posted and that gets reviewed by companies every day um, is enormous. And so there are always go- there are going to be cases where the you know ten or fifteen seconds of human review that makes the decision that account should come down, uh, you know, errors too far on the side of of takedown. Um, and you might be losing really important countering voices in that kind of process. Um, so ensuring that there are ways that people, and, and just kind of generally in the way that we look at how content policies are enforced on platforms, to make sure that they're looked at not just with an eye to how to keep the um, the, the most extreme or violent content off of a platform, but make sure that the space for discussion and debate about that content and about um, these issues more generally can still persist. And we can look into uh, providing additional guidance in addition to what's there uh, for those that are you know, doing the work of counter-messaging. They shouldn't be in a position where when they're doing counter-messaging, they have to uh, be concerned about being accused of providing uh, you know, material support. Um, and you know, we look at all, all of those um, examples on a case-by-case basis, and it, it, it's, it's, it's clear in cases where you know, someone's out there and they're trying to do the good work of countering the message uh, rather than supporting what ISIL is saying. So we're on a, a bit of a tight schedule today, so I want to open it up to questions from the audience so that all of the panelists have a chance to um, to address them, and then it, we have Rashad has to run out, but if we have any final questions, we can um, keep the remaining panelists. So does anyone have anything they'd like to ask? No? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, one other question I had um, is, you know, there are... There have been a f- a several lawsuits against the platforms for for hosting this content, which they're immune to under the law. But can you explain a little bit more about, like, do you think those cases will go anywhere? Do you think they're just people jumping on sort of the the topic of the day? Right. I mean, I, so right. Generally, the the law is pretty clear that um, there's no. There's a strong protections against holding platforms uh, civilly liable for um, for speech that their users post, um, and so I think there have been a, a few cases where people are seeking um, damages for the death of a loved one um, that they try to ultimately tie back to uh, content that had been posted on a social media network. Um, and of course, it's like it's it's always a really heartbreaking story, and you can understand why a person is sort of trying to find some restitution, but I think we need to be very careful about like how broadly we would scope kind of who is the proximate cause of, um, you know, of, of the death of somebody in a terrorist act. Um, and I think trying to, to sweep online platforms in under like a very broad idea of general liability for um, actions that are many steps removed from anything they're directly involved with uh, is ultimately not going to succeed. And I know the Department of Justice has sort of played with the idea of, of going after people who are sharing the content itself. Is that something you're continuing to pursue, or how are you approaching the people who are maybe not promoting the content directly? They're not the recruiters, but they're, they're supporting it and, and sharing it. Yeah, I mean, our approach in this area, of course, is governed by the First Amendment, and there's uh, a, a lot of speech that is protected speech that we may not agree with, but we're not prosecuting those cases. The cases which uh, could be prosecuted are, there's, are there are ones in which there's been a uh, specific threat or solicitation of crimes against particular individuals. And I think, um, Seamus, you referenced one of the cases from Ohio, the McNeil case, but um, th- those are the types of cases that we'd be talking about. So I know we have to wrap up in just a few minutes. So given that this is such a live issue um, and such a, 
important one because it's really it's affecting lives even on on whatever scale is happening it is very uh, distressing i think to the to the public and to the platforms who are having to deal with this and to everyone who's working in it what do you think the most important thing for congress to to take away from this issue is moving forward as they're thinking about how to either legislate or or hold off on legislating or um asking the companies for help and and maybe on the flip side, you know, any other parties involved, what do you think is the most important thing that, that we should be doing to continue the trend of, of individuals rejecting the message uh, that ISIS is spreading online? Yeah, I mean, it's very clear we're not going to kill our way out of this problem. We're not going to delete our way out of this problem. Um, and so we need to continue reaching the right audiences through the right messengers. And that requires, um, of course, not just the government, but a whole range of actors. And I think we've uh, put into place now at the government level and working with so- civil society a number of mechanisms by which uh, we can get out the right counter messaging, the right uh, positive messaging, and then the right positive alternatives uh, for for young people. That, as I spoke about in the beginning, may be disaffected for whatever reason. They may see something that's happening on the on the other side of the world, uh, which they view as an injustice. Uh, atrocity against uh, a whole people, and they say, I cannot sit still. I have to do something about it. So we have to work together to find uh, those mechanisms for that small uh, segment of the population that may be attracted to ISIL's message. And then remember to continue to keep in mind that their message is overwhelmingly rejected already, and we don't want to be reaching out uh, to uh, in, in the name of reaching targeted communities with uh, overbroad tactics or, or messages that could paint uh, entire groups as vulnerable uh, or as a problem uh, when we have a distinct audience that we're trying to reach through some actors. And then in the preventive space, general audiences that we're trying to reach through perhaps um, a set of those actors or, or a different set of actors. Um, and I'd say to uh, for, for Congress and everyone to remember that the U.S. will be watched very closely for our responses to all of this, right? That um, the this kind of the standard that we set and the model that we set can do either a lot of good or or a lot of harm. Um, and so if we can keep it on the side of good, show that there are ways to um, pursue this fight against ISIS that don't involve broad-based censorship that don't try to, you know, play whack-a-mole with extremist content online that are conscious of and actively trying to avoid the sort of stigmatizing effect um, of Muslim communities and instead focus on showing how truly supporting our, you know, our fundamental values of freedom of speech and a right to privacy um, can actually help us succeed in the fight. Uh, I think that's ultimately as a, as a message for what does it mean to you know, to conduct this fight from a position of democratic ideals um, will be much more convincing than an approach that kind of motivated by fear looks to, you know, crack down on more speech and um, and put many more people under scrutiny by the government. I think I'm going to be contrarian for the sake of conversation. <laughs> um, I, I, Congress has the, has the ability to have a large megaphone on this, and, and you see when Congress uses the megaphone in terms of naming and shaming, um, you do actually see action. Um, so I, I don't believe there would be a summit f- convened by the White House if it wasn't for Congress constantly hammering social media companies to um, deal with the content. Right? It, it, it's almost a forcing function. Um, I think there's a reason why uh, YouTube has a flagging for terrorist content. It's because for two years they got beat up on the hill about um, videos of U.S. soldiers being killed um, that were posted by a Baghdad sniper. Um, so it's a balancing act, and I understand the, the free sp- speech and free expression um, issues, um, but Congress can play a role in um, forcing the convening. Um, as uncomfortable as that is. Uh, and because the default of social media companies is, is very libertarian in these type of things, uh, understandably so. Um, but there is a balancing act between, again, the family members that we talk about, that we talk about in the lawsuit, and um, the free expression of, of conversation online. I'm being contrarian to be contrarian, though. Any last questions? Yeah, we have a question from the audience. Is 
I guess I'll start. And maybe uh, it's hard. Um, I think it's nearly impossible. It's easier when you when you focus it down. So if you look at um, there's a think tank in, in the UK that did a very small sample size, about 14 people, where they did direct one on one online interventions. Um, to see how disengagement would work on those type of things. But again, that's a very small sample size, and it's it's very labor-intensive to do that type of things. In terms of broad-based um, messaging and how you measure that, um, very difficult. I mean, how do you measure don't do drugs and see something, say something? It's, it's a very difficult di- dynamic. It's difficult to prove a negative. Um, absent this messaging, who would have gone into violent extremism and who, and who wouldn't? Um, but there, there is data that's out there, um, and we see the types of messages that tend to resonate, that, that get traction, the stories of defectors, for example, the stories of family members. Um, there's data indicating that uh, some of the best inter- in- interveners are family members, and particularly mothers. There's uh, polling data, and I mentioned uh, the poll indicating that 80% of Arab youth between the age of 18, ages of 18 and 24 would never consider joining ISIL, just one year prior, when that same poll was took the num- taken, the, the number was 60%. So you do see trend uh, in some of the polling. We are able to measure what types of uh, messages, and they're oftentimes not government messages, but messages that are out there tend to be picking up traction. But at the end of the day, um, finding the right metrics uh, has its challenges. That doesn't that doesn't mean that there aren't metrics that we can use and that we should continue to use, and we should continue to develop uh, the use of data um, as we uh, engage in what we're doing. I think it's important to make sure that um, you have empirical research, you know, particularly in the area uh, of, of interventions, as Seamus has spoken about, because you do get a sense over time of uh, what types of tools and strategies work and what types don't. Some of that we've seen uh, from the work that's done in Europe and other places. And, we, and so as government, we try to draw on some of those studies that have been done uh, by groups, uh, for example, such as uh, Exit uh, in Germany and others that are operating in the space. And, um, you know, we've, we have examples of programs that have worked and we have examples of programs that haven't worked. And we try to draw from the best and go forward. I know you have to run, so <laughs> sorry about that. But we'll keep the questions going for the other panelists um, right here in the front. I mean, I'd say that's that's a fantastic point, and I think it's been one of the the critiques of kind of the countering violent extremism frame on um, some of the government's work in this area, because it it there's sort of this this back and forth between well, are we talking about all kind of violent extremism? Are we talking about all of the sort of threats domestically to you know violence against civilians, or are we really talking about like anti radicalization for people who might be recruits to ISIS. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's very clear that people notice that sort of, <laughs> that, that shifting of, of target. Um, and, and so I just encourage the government to be a lot clearer about, you know, what is the focus. And if, you know, as you say, if there are actually much more significant threats inside the United States to, like, the safety of our civilian population from people who have really nothing to do with ISIS, uh, prioritizing a focus on that, um, could be very important. 
Yeah, I, I don't think it should be an either or proposition. Um, so when the administration released their strategy on countering violent extremism, um, they said they would focus on for all forms of extremists. In, in, that's in theory. In practice, it's it's focusing primarily on ISIS-inspired terrorism. Um, so let's put that out there. There, but you know, you should be worried about the Nadal Assange of the world as much as you're worried about the Dylan Roofs of the world. Uh, and how you approach these issues are similar dynamic, especially when it comes to interventions. Um, at the program on extremism, we look at all forms of extremists. Um, so we had a paper on domestic terrorism. We're actually looking at this exact issue. Uh, next month we'll have a paper that looks at uh, ISIS supporters online versus uh, white supremacists online. Um, what do they talk about? How is it different? Uh, how is it the same? Uh, what's the followers like on those type of things? So we can have a nuanced conversation about extremism and, and how do we focus our resources on these type of things. Uh, you know, I, I hate to do the numbers on on you know who's been killed more and more likely. It becomes an either or proposition, and I'd rather not do that because at the end of the day, you're talking about families have have lost. Um, you know, when you talk about jihadist inspired terrorism, it, the numbers are pretty similar to white supremacists, sadly, because of San Bernardino uh, a few months a few months back. Um, but again, they're very small when you look at a general population of, of violence in the U.S. <laughs> I do take them. Sure. Sure. Um, I, I mean, it's an excellent point that you raised. That, uh, so I think a, an instructive example is actually some programs that are going on in the United Kingdom and um, at the European Union level. They have these programs called Internet Referral Units, which are actually kind of even one step further than your hypo about kind of funding nonprofits, um, where it's actually members of the government themselves in a, you know, a uh, it's the Metropolitan Police in the United Kingdom, um, kind of uh, chief law enforcement body, who has a unit dedicated to going onto social media platforms, identifying content that they think uh, that they want to see come down, and figuring out which of the platform's terms of service it violates, and so then flagging it to the platforms for their review, so that uh, it's sort of this way of saying, it's like, well, it's it's the platform who's making the decision whether it comes up or comes down. We're just telling them content violates their terms of service. Um, but we think there's a huge concern with that kind of approach. Um, this is, you know, in a formal government program seeking to have certain content removed from the web and because companies terms of service can be much more restrictive than what government can actually go after under the law it's a way for governments to kind of succeed in getting content taken down that they wouldn't actually be able to go after through a court um, and so even when you kind of expand that out a step and say you know that governments are are funding and incentivizing private parties to do this kind of flagging, you still end up back at this question of government action. And so when you've got government identifying particular kinds of content, particular kinds of speakers, and trying to restrict that, even through these somewhat attenuated means, uh, in the U.S., that would raise major First Amendment issues. Let's see if I can take the first one, which was the increase of, of ISIS use of social media comparatively to other terrorist organizations. Um, I mean, uh, we, 
I think it's clear to see that, that ICE has been very adept at use social media. Uh, and, and I say that meaning that, um, you know, anywhere between 4,000 new videos a year. And so they go on, they have Twitter, they have Telegram, they have various different platforms and channels that either can come down or come out depending on the day. So, you know, I'm on 50 Telegram ISIS channels right now. Sorry, Rashad. Um, <laughs> and, and so there's different, there's different ways in order to be entry points to talk to these individuals. Um, think of it like the democratization of, of recruitment. Um, so if I'm, I'll give you an example. So these in, there was three girls from Denver, a 17-year-old, a 16-year-old, a 15-year-old who jumped on a plane um, and were bound to go to Turkey and then cross the border to Syria. They got picked up in Frankfurt and turned around because their father had called every no- phone number in the Colorado phone book until he found an FBI agent. Um, how did they figure out how to do all of this? Well, they went on to a Tumblr page, which is an English language, uh, which gave a step-by-step direction of everything they needed to bring and who to talk to when they got to Turkey and what to say at customs. Um, so it lowers the bar for that a 17-year-old kid from Denver to be able to realize how to make that next step. Uh, now, the always the eager people are always going to figure that out, um, but it, it, it allows for uh, an ability they didn't have before. It also allows for interactivity that you didn't have, similar to what social media is in general. So, you know, I can have a conversation with Emma uh, that I wouldn't be able to have five years ago um, because I know who she is on Twitter and we can go back and forth and DM, similar to I can have a conversation with a foreign fighter in Fallujah right now and ask him everything I need to know in terms of what do I bring, what do I not bring, and who do I talk to. It's concerning and from that, that perspective, and I think that's where ISIS has been very adept at, is, is allowing for... Um, those who would not necessarily be uh, – it's making an ease of use in a way that, that I think is concerning. I'll leave it there. Yeah, I, I, I'd have to point back. I'd have to look back on the notes. Charlie Winter over at Georgia State University does really good work on um, looking at ISIS propaganda online, and you may want to look at his recent reports on that. Um, but I'll pull those and, and get back to you if you give me your card. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a great question, and um, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear from from Seamus of kind of like how you framed your research. But the the concern that we see is that um, you know, it, it sort of it depends on which government officials you're talking to, um, and you know, are you talking to someone from the U.S. or the the U.K. or or Europe? But you know, you can hear from everything from like somebody planning a specific attack that seems, you know, very clearly uh, something that would be unlawful to just sort of general pro-ISIS propaganda. Um, so, you know, heard references to videos that are about, you know, n- not about inspiring any specific violence, but talking about how great life is in the caliphate, what economic opportunities there are, or other just sort of, you know, it's it's views that are, Disagreeable or flat out wrong or, um, you know, just untrue, but it's not anything that falls under kind of traditionally what we consider unlawful speech. Um, it's much more in the kind of building up people's uh, kind of positive feelings about, about ISIS. Um, and so when you see the conversation kind of sliding back and forth between, well, do we want to stop specific like commission of violence or do we want to try to convince people that they're wrong to think in a certain way you know it, it's that ladder where it's really trying to convince people that they have the the wrong view or the wrong ideas um, I don't think is it should be the the goal of any of these programs because I don't think it's it's going to work um, stopping people from committing specific acts of violence is absolutely an appropriate goal um, but trying to kind of win people over to think you know according to a certain set of, of values or beliefs is, I think, a losing proposition. This is also um, one of the reasons that people have brought up, you know, why do the platforms not put in an algorithm like they do for child pornography, for instance? The, you know, the answer being that it's so subjective. Every piece of content is this um, propaganda, is this uh, extremist content, is this incitement to violence? It's, it's a very... Um, it's, it's a scale that you have to really look at each piece of content individually. Is that right. right. Like technically, when companies are filtering for um, child pornography or child abuse imagery, uh, what they're doing is comparing hashes of known images of 
that material to things that are uploaded to their own servers. So they can see, do we get, is somebody trying to, this file that one of our users is trying to upload, does it match to something that we know, we already know about not wanting to have on our platform? Um, that, that's a kind of image matching um, that is very different from the subjective assessment uh, you know, day to day of uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of pieces of content that could run everything from you know a a direct threat to somebody, a stupid joke between friends, a thoughtful discussion about kind of the you know the ideas that ISIS is putting forward, or you know an invitation and instructions for how to to come to Turkey. I mean, it's the just the huge range of content that gets kind of swept up in this extremist content bucket is, as Miranda saying, kind of defies that easy algorithmic assessment. Seamus, how, how have you uh, defined the, yeah, <laughs> the buckets good. in your yeah. research? Um, I think it's important when we talk about ISIS, and, at least in the American context, when we talk about ISIS in America, it's a spectrum. So you, from one side, you have somebody like a 70-year-old Ali Amin who's tweeting to 4,000 followers about how great ISIS is and then drives his best friend to the airport who joins ISIS. Spends 11 years in jail from material support. That's one side of the spectrum, right? On the other side of the spectrum is a guy like Abdullah Bazzara, who's um, from St. Louis, spends 20 years in the U.S., gets his U.S. citizenship, and then 11 days later goes to Syria and becomes a mid-level commander uh, running a battalion of foreign fighters for Omar Shashani. That's also ISIS in America, but there's two different extremes on that. A kid tweeting it in his parents' house and a guy running a battalion. Um, so I, when we look at, the, when we scoped out the report, we looked at um, mostly material support to terrorism charges with a few communicating threats, depending on the nexus to ISIS. Uh, and then, in terms of the extremist content, we look at nodes. So if someone is, you know, tweeting to one follower, sure, yeah, I guess they're, they're an ISIS supporter, but, you know, I'm less interested than I am if they're tweeting to the 10 or so nodes that are pushing out new and interesting content um, that I hadn't seen before, and if they're connected to them, or if they're talking um, or communicating and saying, you know, let's talk on DM. That's where I start become more interested is the connections to it, not just the speech. So a little bit more about the who rather than the what. Yeah, yeah. Any other last questions? Yes. One, let, wait for the mic, if you would. Have you folks considered <clears throat> mocking or making fun of Dizzle and some mm-hmm. of its practices? For example, the men seem to be guys who can't get a day except yeah. that I can kidnap you. So are there alternate approaches to... Uh... Right. No, I mean, I think this is, this is an important question, right? Like, what kind of counter-messaging is going to be effective? And obviously... Right, and so there, and that, and this is where kind of the the term counter speech or counter narrative or messaging really falls apart. Because what we're talking about is people right sharing their views, sharing their ideas. And one thing, I mean, we've just all sort of seen from content on social media is that funny content gets shared a lot more than kind of a nice five paragraph essay carefully breaking down points. There's definitely a room for a role for that too, but. Um, Yeah, so uh, I would hesitate in terms of uh, what intuitively makes sense to us to what intuitively what would be effective for ISIS recruits. So if you actually look at the data of, of um, this is old data, but if you look at um, AQI of mocking videos on that, it was less effective when they had um, videos that were mocking AQI than they were when they were talking about atrocities or killing civilians. Mm-hmm. Um, so Vice came um, had a news article last week about um, a head cam of an ISIS fighter who couldn't shoot straight, right? And that got shared thousands of times and everybody in the media thought it was great and it was a great kind of messaging didn't get any residency in the echo chamber that we were looking at um, in a way that um, which is, is English language ISIS supporters online uh, purported English language support, um, ISIS supporters they tend to 
I have to run the data a little bit more, and we're doing a collection now. Um, they tend to care more about um, both defections, so people that stand up and say, I was wrong, or things like that, they tend to get really angry about that and want to counteract that. Um, there's been a marked shift in messaging um, since the administration talked about the losses uh, of territory. ISIS videos have clearly shifted away from giving candy out to kids in Raqqa to we're winning battles here, there, and there. Um, so I think they're very key, and what we're doing is how they're adjusting um, their messaging on these type of things. And the last thing I think is, is actually quite an, an, uh, effective, at least from um, looking at it in different instances, is uh, when you bring up um, families and 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 the dangers, uh, what happen when an individual goes to Syria and Iraq and what they do when they leave their families behind, um, there's a level of effectiveness there. Um, you know, I'm talking to a, a number of individuals who are true believers on this, but when you bring up family members and say, have you talked to your mom lately, or what do you think about the fact that you left them behind, uh, they tense up in a way that, that I'm not used to seeing them for them. I think there's an effective of things. This is also to say radicalization is a highly complex and, and not a linear process, right? Humans, by their very nature, are complex. So disengagement or de-radicalization is going to be equally as complex and not linear. People are going to go float in and out. Things that work for you are not going to work for you. Um, so how do we figure that out in terms of tailoring messaging? It's something that Rashad is going to have to figure out for me. Um, it's very difficult to, to figure out that dynamic. Any last points on that? Okay. Um, well, thank you all for coming out. Um, we appreciate you coming out. And we have up upcoming events in the next few months. Keep your eye on the, the mailing list for the Congressional Internet Caucus or their website, netcaucus.org. And have a great weekend. Thank you. That next report you have. Yeah.